Welcome to the Sweet Science of Fighting podcast. Today we have Edward Baker. Welcome, Edward. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. No, thanks for coming on. And I've been following you for a while with <clears throat> some of the research you've been doing. You've kind of gone down the rabbit hole. You mentioned before this, you're, you're working mainly in boxing, MMA, and Muay Thai, which is awesome because we can kind of dive into similarities of all three in, in your research. But do you want to maybe give a brief background about yourself, Edward, for people who don't follow you and aren't aware of what you're doing? Sure, yeah. So in my day job, I am a university lecturer at the University of Gloucestershire in strength and conditioning and rehabilitation, both undergrad and postgrad. And I've been a strength and conditioning coach now since, well, I did my master's at Middlesex in 2009, and I've been employed as an S&C coach uh, since that point. And so uh, now have my own company, The Fight Lab, and I specialize in working with fighters. And I have a handful of hand-picked athletes that I coach personally that I can do in and around my job. And then I also provide online coaching and education through the Fight Lab. Awesome. Did, did you start your SNC within combat sports or you started in other sports? Started my, I mean, combat sports has been my passion pretty much my whole life. Did judo as a kid. And then in my 20s, I was big into my boxing and Muay Thai, competed in Muay Thai, not very good, but loved the sport <laughs> and was absolutely obsessed with it for a few years. Trained at Minotaur Gym in London, which is now the Nolsey Academy and still a great gym and producing a lot of top uh, fighters. Um, you know, spent some time in Thailand, that sort of thing. So always into combat sport and I was a personal trainer. Yeah. Uh, that was my job and I decided after a few years of that that I wanted to work more with athletes and I wanted to know more about it so I went back to uni and did a master's and then became an S&C coach and I've been worked in lots of different sports which you know, I'm happy to talk about as well and still work in a couple of different sports now but uh, have always wanted to uh, be in a position yeah. where I could offer the best kind of advice and training to fighters because that's just what I love watching. I love being around the boxing gym. I'm always watching it. So it's uh, a lifelong passion. Yeah. No, I love it. And I think I think a lot of <clears throat> physical preparation coaches come into combat sports, even myself, come from other sports just because the professionalism isn't isn't there in combat sports to you know give you a full time job and work in that profession. And then <clears throat> once you get to a point where and you're done with a certain sport or you're working for yourself then you're in a position to be able to go into combat sports but until then it's like you can't you can't really get in there unless you're I don't know, doing a lot that's of right. personal training on the side etc that's right there's one or two jobs you know I used to work for the English Institute of Sports mm. called the UK Sport Institute now I mean you've got boxing amateur boxing that's in Sheffield great program I think there's two SEC yeah. staff you've got taekwondo Again, I'm good mates with uh, Guy Reese, who's just left Taekwondo to go to cycling, being a one SNC coach. Uh, and he did that job for, I think, three Olympic cycles. So, as you say, there, it's not like there's a ton of jobs at a mm. high level combat sport out there. Uh, it's more like, say, guys with a passion and then bringing their skills into that sport when they get the chance. Yeah, it's good though, because you get a lot of outside looks in there. But I know, I know you're doing a lot of research currently within commerce bills do you want me to dive into a little bit of what you're doing there and then we can kind yeah. of go into some of the, the findings you have or any practical applications sure so uh this is again kind of bringing it full circle when i did my masters i did my thesis dissertation whatever uh on punch force and um it was a single subject case study it was one of the guys the muay thai fighters from the gym mm -hmm. who had a good record i think he'd had 50 fights and maybe 46 wins and he was decent and so we got him in the gym and uh, I mean it was talk about unscientific we just stuck a force plate to the wall you know with some screws and we put a kick shield over it really <laughs> and then we had a one another force plate but it wasn't very big it was big enough for one foot to go underneath it so we had one foot the back foot under a force plate and we put a few um, joint markers on like the wrist, elbow, shoulder, pelvis, and we just had him like whack this force plate basically <laughs> and turn the camera on and see what we could measure. And uh, did actually publish the findings of that. We used the kinematic data, so the movement, the joint movements. And, you know, mm -hmm. we showed pretty much what you'd expect. Uh, rear, rear leg moves first, right? Pelvis rotates and then there's kind of a delay and then the shoulder rotates but through a mm -hmm. bigger arc and then the hand moves last, right? And so we wrote that up and published it, and that was great. And there were some similarities to things like pitching a baseball or throwing a javelin. Like, 
developing a forward momentum, then the front foot acts as a brake and you rotate over that, right, and hit the target. So that was MSC thesis. Then I went off and got a job and, you know, over 10 years <laughs> later, I'm now working in university. I've got a bit of access to equipment and I'd like to say I've got time. I don't really have time, but you find time. So, um, you know, the, the game hasn't really moved forward that much in terms of what's the gold standard to measure punch force. A couple yeah. of researchers around the world have done the same thing. They put force plate on the wall, they put a pad over it, and they got guys to punch it, and they've tested some other things. But nobody's published their methodology because the big question is, well, what's the pad doing? What's the glove doing? How much mm -hmm. is that taking out of the impact, and how sensitive is it? And uh, that's the kind of question we're trying to answer first, and then we're going to see if we can get – a 360 degree view of how you punch. So force at the floor, motion mm. capture for the whole body. We want to put the sensors on the muscle as well, EMG, at the key muscle groups, and then we'll get the impact force. So we can describe and explain the punch, and then we can look at what the underlying factors mm. that contribute to punch force. And the question is, you know, punches, are they born or are they made? I'm um, mm. pretty sure that you can make them, and that's what we're trying to find out. Dude, I love that. Have you? Uh, I don't know if you listen to the podcast at all, but I don't know if, if you listen to Wes Elliott, who was on recently, uh, who owns Strike Tech Boxing Sensors. He's got a lot of good right. data on that. I have to link you up after this. Um, I love that. Yeah, he's analyzed that it. One. I've listened to a couple of your episodes in preparation with um, Boxing Science and a couple of other ones that I just, you know, working back through them. But I'll, I'll have to take a listen to that. Yeah, yeah. He's. <clears throat> I'll link you guys up <clears throat> afterwards. But he's got some awesome data from analyzing a shit ton of bare knuckle boxes, uh, UFC guys with the sensors and kind of getting like a lot of like forced time graphs with it and things like that. Yeah, I'll link you guys up. I think you guys will get along way too well sounds with good. it. It's very similar, similar research. Yeah, so uh, around that research, I know you mentioned around the kinematic data. I wanted to ask you in terms of practical applications, obviously you talk about it starts on the rear leg, at least when we're, uh, and then the pelvis turns, specifically talking about kind of like a cross uh, punch. Yeah. But yeah. In terms of practical applications with training, <clears throat> how does that translate into your strength conditioning program, or or does it have any bearing at all? Yeah, I mean all the all the available evidence, which and kind of a common sense approach would suggest that it's it's all lower body power. So strong, powerful legs seem to differentiate performers in pretty much all fight sports. That's through MMA any kickboxing based or any boxing based sports and that the more elite the participant the greater the contribution of the lower body to the movement and uh, that makes sense from a mechanical perspective and from like a skill perspective mm. and i can talk about those if you want yeah let's do it why, about why it makes sense so firstly from a uh, we start with the skill perspective, like the the beginner or the the novice, you know, does an arm punch, mm. and you know the the rest of their body's frozen. They're just they're just punching with their arm, and that makes sense because when you're not skilled at a movement, we know the nervous system restricts the degrees of freedom you have access to, and it'll actually freeze the lower body so that you can punch with the arm. But the more skilled you become, the greater amount of joints, muscles, and everything you can recruit in a sequence and so the more skilled you are you can basically hit punch someone with your whole body you know you're punching them with with your, your whole body weight and all the momentum you can generate so from a skill perspective it makes sense that the lower body would be involved and you're standing on the ground that's how you develop force but then from a mechanical perspective the same is true right so if you're able to initiate the movement with the back foot and push into the ground which isn't going to move the world isn't, isn't really going to move. It pushes back. And the more you push, the more it pushes back, the more you can transfer uh, into the hand. And so being able to rapidly push against the floor, not lose any energy, and then also use that front leg as a stiff break, you'll mm. be able to transfer more. And, you know, this is happening in 0 0.2, 0 0.3 of a second, depending on where you measure the start from. And obviously, again, your more elite guys can disguise um, or conceal the fact that they've begun the movement with something mm. with their lead hand or a jab or something else. 
Um, and then, yeah, the hand's going to move last. So it's really the whole body in motion and the hand goes on the end. Because, it, because the force is generated so quickly, does that influence the style of, I guess, strength training you're doing and maybe not relying as much on maximal strength and more so on trying to improve the ability to produce it quickly? Or, or is your philosophy around, hey, we just got to get strong and powerful regardless? Yeah, I think uh, the latter. I think, you know, you want to take out the best insurance policy, you know, you can. And being stronger is never a drawback, right? Uh, and so definitely, depending on where your listeners are at in their in their career, both as an athlete, like strength trained, and then as a fighter, mm. um, if you don't strength train at all or you're not very strong for your weight, then getting stronger in your basic movements will always translate to like an increase in power as it's the foundation of kind of all of your neuromuscular capabilities so it's never a bad idea to get stronger in your basic movements but definitely to push things to the max and to train in the correct kind of time frames that we're talking about then yeah you have to do explosive training and so that's jumping plyometrics and med ball work which i think is really valuable and that definitely forms the second half of a training camp uh, you know, it's kind of unloading from some of that heavier stuff and really going for the maximal intensity, jumping, bounding and throwing. I hope you're enjoying the chat so far. Before we get back to that, I just want to let you know that Sweet Science of Fighting is more than just a podcast. We have a full training app with strength conditioning programs for strikers, grapplers and MMA athletes. So you don't have to think about what you're doing and you're getting access to the latest scientific methods to improve combat sports performance. We have programs specifically for judo, for jujitsu, for wrestling, MMA, boxing, Muay Thai is coming soon. All these things are going to be in the training app. We also have a private community where some of the coaches that have been on the podcast are in there to help you with any training questions and any performance questions you have. For example, Andrew Usher and Casper DeVitt. We also have some online courses within the training app. They cover strength, conditioning, mental skills, and weight cutting. And finally, we now have Ryan Villalobos in the community, a second degree jiu-jitsu black belt, who is there to break down any of your grappling matches that you want seen to by a second eye. He's currently breaking down videos on a separate Sweet Science of Fighting YouTube channel and he will break down your video within the community. So if you have a match or a role that you just recorded, you can upload that in there and Ryan will break that down for you. So what are you waiting for? Jump down in the description. You can check out the Sweet Science of Fighting underground. Otherwise, enjoy the podcast. Nice. We'll dive into that soon as well. I wanted to come back to as well, obviously the idea of kind of the sequence starts at the leg, the pelvis turns and kind of the shoulder turns after, almost like a whip, as you mentioned, like with the with a baseball pitch or a javelin throw. And I mean, if you go down, I guess, I mean, I guess Franz Bosch kind of made it popular with, with the whole dynamical systems theory and his approaches around it, around upper lower dissociation, basically the upper body being able to do something while the lower body can do something else. That would be a, a pretty good example there, having the pelvis and leg kind of rotating forward while the shoulder's still behind, ready to whip. I don't know, is there any kind of coordinative approach to training that you take there or any of those concepts that you apply within uh, your boxing training? Mm. Yeah, Bosch is an interesting one. I mean, I think I now teach the dynamical systems oh, stuff nice. to, uh, for, uh, and students here, but it took me, if I just be me, it took me like two years to understand that. Dude, it's tough, man. It's, it's, it, it's confusing. A lot of it is deliberately overcomplicated. Um, I think that, uh, well, look, a golf swing is a really good example of what we're talking. It's kind of an extreme yeah. version of what we're talking about, which is, you know, club head speed, right, is the, uh, uh, the underpinning thing for driving distance. And part of that is going to come from the torque, and part of that is going to come from the range, right? So the further you can twist, the, i.e. the further you can dissociate or if you like or separate the shoulder from the pelvis the, the club's going to travel through a bigger arc it's going to develop more speed you're going to hit harder the ball will go further and so that's it's similar to a, a punch particularly if you counter and you've wound up there are obviously some kind of key key differences tactically but yeah so that skill is going to be developed by pun by punching yeah and i don't think you can necessarily any any other exercise that's not punching is by nature general yeah and so 
I would look at, can I provide the um, ingredients, if you like, that would go into that? And so in no particular order, that would be mobile hips, specifically internal rotation at the hip, because your backhand, the opposite hip, the front hip, rotates internally as you twist through the punch. And if you're restricted there, you can't internally rotate and you won't be able to develop as much power. So mm. mobile hips, strong legs, an extremely strong back and trunk, strong shoulders <laughs> that can also externally and internally rotate and, you know, very strong upper back muscles, healthy elbows, you know, so can you give a training program that addresses all of these things so that the athletes got the body that's capable of then performing the sports movement? Um, so the people I work with are already skilled in punching. You can always be better. Um, but it's my job to ensure the kind of, I don't know, the meat covered robot, if you like, is <laughs> upgraded to a level where all the constituent parts work as well as we can get them to work so that they can then express that doing their technique. And med ball's great. And I love med ball throws. I do loads of them. And mm. I think they're really good. But it's still general. It's still not, it's not a punch. It's still quite general. Nice. Do you have any specific, I guess, exercises or drills you go to for improving that kind of hip internal rotation or, or even some of the shoulder external internal rotation? Yeah. And, um, I mean, it's, it's really PNF stretching, which, you know, I think many years ago as personal trainers, we all learned a PNF hamstring. <laughs> yeah. Hamstring. <laughs> It's always the one where you've got your partner's legs straight. They push into you for a bit, then you push back, you know. Now, that's been the whole PNF thing has been rebranded by a bunch of different people. There's the FRC guys, functional range oh, conditioning. Yeah. That's all right. All that type of stuff. I think we had a course years ago in EIS on micro stretching. So, every I haven't again, heard of that one. Rebrands <laughs> it, right? But um, really, the principle the principle is you take the joint it's first of all it's active not passive i.e., like the the athletes doing the stretch like they would do a rep in a bicep curl or a squat they're, they're doing reps mm -hmm. and you take the joint to the position of restriction so you you internally rotate it till it's a little bit tight and you train it in that range and so you then isometrically try to go further against resistance and you'll train both sides of the joint isometrically in the position in which you're tight it doesn't take very much of that to make quite rapid changes you've got to think like what's the restriction was there, there might be a neural or a structural um uh, restriction there it's mostly neural mm. and so to do that you have to be in that position you have to apply force in that position and you have to do it repeatedly and isometrics are a great way of doing that so um on my i mean sometimes share stuff like this on instagram like really easy hip rotation warm-ups and i think you should put you know put it in the warm-up or the cool down and you should have some kind of daily hip and shoulder routine of, of a few minutes that addresses joint health, like in the capsule, and addresses you know your range of motion. And uh, even if you've got lot, if you're 21 and you've got lots of range now, <laughs> great. Believe me, if you want to stay in the game, <laughs> you want to carry out daily maintenance on those joints. It's only ever going to benefit you. So it's superior to static stretching, in my view, because moving your own joints is quite difficult. Mm -hmm. to do particularly at the hips people are not very coordinated they're not very familiar with that part of their body so it improves your coordination which is part of mobility as well nice no i like that i'm with you on the uh, whole static stretching thing too but i wanted to dive into all right because you obviously work with a range of of different combat sports boxing mma muay thai uh, does your approach to strength conditioning let's just let's just stay with strength training for now we can kind of move to conditioning but just to make it, the question a little short smaller but um in terms of differences between MMA, boxing, and Muay Thai, does, does your approach change much, or is it that most people kind of just need the same stuff along all those sports? Strength is a general quality, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, bar lifting barbells and other kind of traditional strength training equipment is one of the easiest and most accessible and scalable ways to do it. So, in a way, yes, you know, if, when people have an underdeveloped level of strength. Uh, then general strength training is pretty much always going to benefit them. But yes, there are some ways that I would definitely tailor it towards different sports. And it's pretty common sense within MMA, athletes do seem to still devolve into kind of either a striking 
they're a striker first, mm. you know, the grappler second, or the other way around, they're a grappler first and then they've added strike. And even though that sport, the level is just accelerating all the time and there are so many hybrids now, yeah. it's still the case that you kind of, you either favor the striking game or the grappling game and they are slightly different. And so being a striker is more about velocity and it's more about um, more kind of explosive chaining combinations together, moving in and out, right? And whereas your grappling is more that sustained kind of <laughs> almost quasi-isometric contractions where you're working to achieve a better position or you're being defensive. And so you can definitely bias your training more towards one of those if you think that that's going to be important for your, your next fight or for your game. Um, having said that, I think that overall for all fighters, what I'd call like peripheral endurance is under served. Everyone's looking at you know, more running or more circuits, which are probably addressing like heart and lungs uh, mostly, which is great and you, you need that, but they're all kind of aerobically fit. Hmm. I think. I think what the science is telling us is you can have a range of VO2 maxes, you know, a range of aerobic abilities as measured by running, um, but that doesn't explain endurance in fighting. It's probably much more about what's happening in the muscle and the peripheral endurance, so the ability of the specific muscles to keep contracting. And so I like to look at that with the gym work. You know, you can, there's, you can look at upgrading the horsepower with your strength, basic strength training, but I think there's a lot of gains to be had in specific <laughs> muscular endurance. Yeah. You just made Andrew Usher's day saying that he's probably going to, he's probably going to message me later on if, after he listens to this, just because of what you just said now, <laughs> now with his, no, his research. Uh, Andrew's a, a very smart guy and, um, you know, he's thinking differently as well. He's thinking, mm. thinking in a way that not a lot of other people are thinking about this and he, he's at a uni and he's researching and you know, he's publishing as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, he definitely knows a lot more about the physiology side, uh, but uh, I, I do, I do think. I mean, you know, if we look at VO2 max is the gold standard of aerobic capacity, and I've tested fighters on VO2 max. And you typically do it running, and you're on the treadmill. You've got the yeah. gas mask on. Um, it's the most reliable test we know for that. But still, running's very general. It's not specific to boxing or MMA. It doesn't happen at all in that. And we see elite fighters with a range of VO2 maxes from amateur boxers in the kind of in the low 50s. Um, there's a pro I work with, and he's 60, 67. Wow. Like that's a really that's a high score. That's kind of up there with Premiership footballers who do run for ninety minutes or more. But if you took all of those, you know, you wouldn't say any of them were unfit at boxing. They're mm. all this is all research from kind of top level amateur and pros. So that on its own is not enough to determine you know whether you're fit enough. Uh, it's not just about the heart and lungs, or they are an essential part. It's a lot to do with the muscle and specific endurance. And so, yeah, MMA for sure, five minute rounds, the constraint of grappling, being taken down, having to escape. You know, I'd definitely be looking at how to improve kind of the muscle groups that are involved in that, um, you know, and slightly differently for boxing. So do you find most of the fighters that come to you are already, I guess you could say, centrally or, or VO2 max or aerobically fit, but struggle with that kind of muscular endurance side? They're all fit, obviously, when compared to, you know, the people who don't do that sport or the, or the, or the, or the non-elite participants in the gym. Mm. But sometimes it's hard to work out whether that's truly like an athletic difference or well, they're just technically superior, technically mm. intact superior. Yeah. Because it's definitely, everyone's got a pace, speaking of boxing now is a, a good one mm. to think of. Everyone's got a pace that they're comfortable at fighting at, yeah. including all the, all the top pros. And it's when you can push that person outside of that pace that their limitations are revealed. So it becomes, you don't know which one has come first, but people have, you know, people's fitness almost matches the technical ability to control the pace of a round. Mm. Uh, and I find also with a lot of traditional boxing training, if they're not doing kind of strength and conditioning work that's outside of the traditional boxing training, again, everything's kind of in a similar 
in a similar physiological zone. Yeah. You know, it's mostly three minutes on, one minute off or 30 seconds rest. You know, it's lots of reps. And if it's happening for three minutes, it's not intense. Mm. It's just not. So I think a lot of fighters could benefit from stepping outside of the kind of what they're doing. Maybe they're in the third or fourth gear and spend a bit more time in kind of top gear for short periods and really push intensity. So much shorter, but more maximal, super maximal intervals. And that's the same for lifting weights and for kind of energy system stuff. So you kind of just briefly touched on it now, but we'll go down that rabbit hole around. You obviously, we've been talking about the peripheral side of the conditioning. So what are some things that you like to use then to help develop, uh, I guess, this ability for the muscles to to resist fatigue during oxy MMA or Muay Thai and all that? A couple different things. So uh, I'll use some, the context, I'll explain it. Let's say it's an eight-week fight camp. It's actually nine because it's eight weeks of training and then a taper, but talk about typical eight week, which is a classic kind of block that we use. Mm -hmm. And the first four weeks, we'll use some circuit training. And it's quite general movements, squats, jump squats, um, you know, presses, press-ups, pull-ups, that type of stuff. Uh, So they're all general movements, but uh, kind of continuous rhythmic movements. So there's a skill that athletes learning and has to be efficient. And we'll have a one-to-one work to rest. And that might be 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. But we'll repeat that for 36 minutes. Um, and the key is to not have a drop-off mm. in kind of output, but to be consistent. And so, and typically I'll stagger like a lower body and an upper body um, activity. or pair them one after another. So again, the system, the heart and lungs getting work really hard there, pushing the blood up and down. Um, but we're choosing kind of exercises that are rhythmic and continuous in nature. Mm. And they use a, a larger range of motions, so like a deeper squat and a deeper press than you, than you, the athlete would do kind of in their boxing room. And then we complement that with some typical weight training, but slow tempo, really horrible, <laughs> like four to six seconds down, yeah. two to four seconds up and kind of continuous tension. And I do this by time. So, a 30 second set and they stretch those out to 45 or even 50 seconds Ooh. of why I'm under tension. That sounds tough. Yeah, horrible. yeah it's horrible. <laughs> and then complete rest. And that's, yeah, you know, your muscle buffering. It's, that's almost a bit like kind of your old school bodybuilding training, but that's mm. not the reason, that, not the reason that we're doing it. Yeah. Um, and in those camp conditions with all the other training and everything else, you, you don't get any, it's not like you get mm. loads of unwanted hypertrophy. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're kind of targeting the, the endurance potential of those muscle fibers. Mm-hmm. Um, and it doesn't take, well, in my experience, you know, you don't need much. You need a couple of sessions a week for three to four weeks and you start to see changes quite rapidly. Also, that type of training as well is very healthy on the joints. Yeah, I can imagine. I imagine it's they feel great. Yeah, submaximal. That's actually great for the, all the guys. Uh, I mean, over, I'm over forty, and uh, even though it's psychologically taxing, it burns like hell. Super healthy, yeah. uh, which has you know, it's very, very good for kind of your tendons and connective tissues. So it's all part of, you know, it's all part of it as well. Uh, but three, three to four weeks of that type of training, and then in the second half of um, the camp, more specifics. And by that, I, will, I mean boxing. So, for example, one of the sessions we might do is have um, a part the pad man wearing the body shield and the pads and we would have you know an ex- a combination of three to six punches in length and we're trying to throw three punches a second so fast mm-hmm. and we might do you know six to mm-hmm. 15 seconds of work at max effort yeah and then 15 to 30 seconds of rest and it would go it would progress from passive to active rest. Gotcha. So towards the end of the camp, the active rest doesn't look very much like rest. It's kind of defensive footwork. And again, depending on the level of the athlete, how good they are, you know, the better they are at breathing through their nose and recovering whilst they're moving, they're learning a skill as well. They're learning a skill of kind of relaxing and breathing under pressure. Um, and then repeating that, and we repeat that for a, a sequence, you know, over time. So then, that's in a specific regime, if you like. Steal that from that Verkashansky book, which mm-hmm. I love. 
Um, so yeah, you kind of move from more general stuff that's just targeting the, the muscle architecture and the enzymes you want to grow in there to, to make you recover faster and tolerate more, more of that kind of acid environment and then make it more specific towards the end of the camp. It sounds like it kind of links up with what you're saying around um, fighters have a pace they like to fight at, and you know when they move out of that pace and are fast, that's when you see the limitations. It sounds like almost that kind of training. Obviously, it's you should class it as you know sprint interval training or you know, whatever high intensity training with the pads, maximal efforts. But it sounds like it also plays a role in giving them a new pace to fight at and get used to for when they actually spar and actually go into competition. Absolutely, I think uh, again this is more. The more elite you become, the more kind of different things you can bear in mind. I'm talking about the fighter in terms of what they're achieving, what they're getting out of it. And yeah, I mean, you can't do anything about three minutes long and it's one minute rest in a professional fight. And one minute is not long enough to completely recover if you've emptied your tank in the three minutes. So in other words, if you've maxed out your anaerobic capacity... Uh, trying to put someone away, uh, you see this all the time, uh, then you can't recover sufficiently yeah. to do that again. And therefore, you have to know, and you have to have like an absolutely, it, it can never be clear enough your own sense of exactly what gear you're in and how much headroom you've got. And of course, the more headroom you've got in any round, the bigger the advantage you have. So you want to be able to fight at the fastest, highest pace you can with an extra gear to go that you can, you can always select when you need it. That's definitely the way I look at it. And that, that I believe strongly that, uh, yeah, manipulating these periods of very intense kind of work to rest intervals and keeping them going over time and then progressing by a few seconds, the length of time the athlete can sustain them, mm. this really, really helps like you said to educate them about you know what they've got I was watching I was at a fight on Saturday pleased to say one of the guys I work with won the IBO Continental featherweight title nice uh, congrats yeah round two knockout stunning knockout Shabir Hadery so he's he's brilliant he's one to watch but on that card there were two guys fighting for a vacant uh, light heavyweight Africa title and it was an absolute barnstormer of a fight I mean <laughs> The two guys were blocking the majority of the punches with their chin for like every single one. <laughs> and, uh, but there was, I think it might be round three, they both stepped on it, you know, gave it everything. And uh, you can see the physiology in action. The next two rounds, you know, they were punching, but with, you could see, it was sort of 50% as hard. And they were both absolutely exhausted. And it was kind of, it was a question of who was going to be able to just recover first. Mm. And you can't cheat the physiology, right? So if you push it to the limit, uh, the minute is not enough to recover. Yeah. So you, yes, you have to know where am I and how many gears have I got left. Hey guys, it's me again. I just want to let you know that I also have Sweet Science of Fighting rash guards and shorts so you can represent Sweet Science of Fighting on the mats and within competition. We have the classic, just like the shirt I'm wearing, rash guard, Sweet Science of Fighting on the front and we have the logos on the sleeves and then X Marsh on the back. We also have that in a shorts variation. Same thing with the Sweet Science of Fighting writing on one leg, and we have the logo on the other. But my personal favorite, this is my personal favorite by far. We have this in black and white, and it is the Tani Far Protector Guardian version of the Sweet Science of Fighting logo on the back. This was designed by a Māori designer back in New Zealand, so a bit of my heritage on this jersey. It represents the acknowledgement of battle and war. It also represents strength and stability and also has the New Zealand silver fern. But even if you're not a Kiwi, cop this. This is an awesome design. It is a custom made design. You will not find it anywhere else. So check that. That'll also be down in the description with a discount code. But back to the podcast. That's such a, such a good advertisement as well for really pushing yourself with some of these maximal efforts. Because as you mentioned, a lot of people are doing these specific quote-unquote <clears throat> rounds of three minutes on one minute off like you mentioned but you you're never pushing to the extent you can when you're doing those 10 15 20 second rounds yeah. and that, that, that as you mentioned that lets you know kind of where that ceiling is that you can kind of base the rest of your whatever you know the rest of your fight plan or sparring or whatever it is off that pace so you know hey i've done x amount of rounds at this intensity i know how i feel and you can gauge by how you feel 
you know, from those totally rounds. Agree. Totally agree. Yeah, you need, you need the three minutes on, one minute off sparring because you have to learn the yeah. pace of the round. There's so many other things in sparring. You're trying out new things, testing techniques. It's a gauge. Uh, I look at the sparring as, as if you played football and the Saturday is your match day. Mm-hmm. So, you know, your, your week is arranged around performing well in sparring and then kind of reflecting on, right, well, how do I improve? So there's lots of other things going on. There are lots of constraints that prevent you necessarily from going 100%, yeah. uh, like how good the other person is. So, um, yeah, you have to find time in the week to kind of, yeah, physically push um, to, the, to the max, but not every, not every day, key sessions. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, where does that conditioning fit within a week for you? So I'm assuming, obviously, you're working around technical training. If end of the week sparring is the most important, you're kind of probably working back from there. So where do those conditioning sessions fit? Yeah, the sparring, it would be great if the sparring was at the end of the week and always on the same day, but never is. <laughs> uh, moves around, so you have to be flexible. And we have kind of, uh, basically what, we, what I have for pros is, you know, the 24 hours before you spar and the 24 hours after you spar is kind of, we know what we're going to do. So whatever day that occurs on, you know, you've rung up another gym, you've arranged some sparring for a Wednesday. It's like, right, so I now know what Tuesday looks like and I know what Thursday looks like. And then we can slot our other stuff in around that because I believe it's really important to perform well, you know, in sparring, particularly if you go to another gym, if it's with the same training partners at your home gym, it's okay. You can be flat and tired. You know, this is going to happen. But I think if you're testing yourself against somebody new and it's a big deal, you should perform well. So, uh, but yeah, how does it look? Well, all the, the pros I know will, will train boxing every day. And often that's in the afternoon. So they're in the boxing gym doing boxing specific training. Either they've got gloves on and punching and that's in the afternoons. And some of that I might feed into in terms of, you know, advising work to rest or what to work on. But typically, you know, my sessions will be elsewhere in the day. So maybe the morning mm-hmm. and that might be, you know, two to three, uh, resistance training and two to three energy system training per week, depending on the person. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the average might be two lifts and then, you know, two to three kind of energy system work. Uh, but of course, if you, if you do a Tyson Fury and you just, you know, blow up in between, and then you <laughs> do it all in weeks, it's a lot harder. You know, I always, always advise everybody, you know, that you're a, a full-time athlete and you, you live like that. Right. So when you're off camp, there's kind of specific things you're developing and the more you develop your aerobic base off camp, then the easier it is for you to tap into this much more specialized, specific, really high intensity stuff in camp. And the same with your strength training. If you're an absolute monstrously strong before the eight week camp and really fit, now you can be much more clinical and targeted about what you do and when in your camp. That's the way to go rather than having to do it all and worry about the weight cut <laughs> in eight weeks. Yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> for sure. And obviously we, we talked about the, the fight camp itself. You mentioned the first half and the second half. And that second half, you mentioned obviously the maximal pad work, but in terms of strength training, what usually goes on within your sessions there as you're leading up to the fight, obviously with the weight cut to deal with and everything yeah. else? So I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm into the, I'm into kind of block training. I guess I um, started this with wheelchair rugby that I worked for mm. GB wheelchair years ago and uh, in the lead up to the 2016 Paralympics and then again, Tokyo and it worked for me and it worked for them and it uh, works with our calendar and our month system and everything just seems to tie together and there's a lot of good physiological data scientific data behind this particularly from athletics and sprinting right Mm -hmm. where they'll do blocks of concentrated loading you know to do with strength and power and then you know unload those athletes and as in they don't then lift as frequently but they run a lot more and then with that we do see delayed compensation effects kind of weeks after this block of concentrated loading and we know this it's the same for marathon training you know you do longest run three weeks out and it's the same for a lot of other sports so i like to have a heavy emphasis on general strength and aerobic fitness off camp so running more frequently or whatever modality you choose and lifting heavy barbell training basic three to five reps three to five sets Mm -hmm. compound movement off camp and then first four weeks uh again depends on the athlete and the weight they're going to fight at and whatever else they've got going on but 
we will do the sort of circuit training that I mentioned that is much more to do with the peripheral endurance. Uh, and then we'll do some, we will do some kind of contrast gotcha. training. So yeah, just yeah, your classic, like heavy squat, heavy trap bar, deadlift, loaded jump, unloaded jump, low mm-hmm. reps, um, lots of that, and depth jumps, um, single and double leg, bounding, that kind of stuff, uh, but closer to the fight. Um, and uh, what I found, and I have kind of experimented with a couple of guys, is that it depends on the athlete too, but it's possible to not touch a barbell for eight weeks and not really lose any strength when we mm. go back in the gym after the fight maybe five percent if that in terms of a kind of a daily one rm or a daily three rm provided you're doing you know we do other things we've got hill sprints we've got lots of jumping bio yeah. squat jumps you know maybe like light loaded jumps with dumbbells mm-hmm. this seems this uh, and the well-planned camp seems to preserve like general strength abilities you don't lose them which means you can kind of tap into those gains again in the next phase um and that's been true for a couple of years for the people that i've worked with they've just continually increased in their kind of basic barbell lifts even if we're coming out of that for four to six even eight weeks at a time yeah i'm with you on that on, on retaining those abilities like jumping and jumping and stuff seems so far away from i guess heavy lifting but it tends to retain those qualities so well. It's just kind of like everything affects everything instead of a lot of people see, kind of see everything as real binary. Like this only yeah. trains my maximal strength. This only trains my power, but it kind of all interrelates. It's neural. Both. Yeah, exactly. It's neural, right? The reason it ends you, you're right. It relates to everything because you, when you're training strength training, you train your nervous system to recruit mm-hmm. lots of muscles at once. So the stuff that wastes quickly is that buffer, is that muscular endurance. Mm. That, that doesn't hang around, which is why you can you can kind of bring it up quite quickly. Yeah, and main, and then you you know you're growing basically you're growing a bunch of enzymes that, that are going to help you in a really acidic muscle environment. Uh, but you stop doing it; it's hard to do. Um, you know to keep that going year round. Uh, but uh, you you stop doing that and you lose that ability very quickly. Also because all the other training they're doing, which is very aerobic in nature, is pulling the body in kind of a different direction yeah. to that. So you don't hold on to that stuff. But if you're really nearly well trained, you know it's an expression of of strength. You know it's quite general. And if you hold on to that, um, it does depend on the athlete because some people are just natural kind of mesomorphic gainers <laughs> and there are others that are not you know they're kind of more that hard gainer and they would need probably strength exposure all the way up to the fight yeah um you know if i think back to different cohort of athletes and i used to work with england netball obviously all female athletes it's like a different hormonal environment yeah and it's a different sport as well but i was absolutely convinced that yeah heavy strength training you needed a weekly exposure year round it had a protective effect, it had a potentiating effect, uh, you know, and it had a kind of performance enhancing effect. So they would lower body lift heavy at least once a week, all year round. And mm. I, I think that was absolutely key. So it does depend on the individual. Yeah, nice. And then <clears throat> regarding the actual fight week, how, how does your training change and look during that time? Obviously with the weight cut and everything else involved. You know, that quest like what what is the right the optimal seven days look like <laughs> question i would love to do some some research i'm planning to do something which we can talk about um about how to optimize yeah that, but go into it uh yeah i think there's so many other things going on uh certainly kind of in the professional space where the making weight the dehydrating, the check weigh-in, yeah. um, any media, you know, getting your T-shirts, talking to the sponsors. There's all this extra stuff kind of rushes in. And all the hard work's done. So, again, it depends on the person, but from my experience, most fighters, you know, they love training and, and uh, you know, the, as it gets closer, the mind starts playing tricks and of course they're used to this really high chronic training load they're used mm. to being in the gym all hours a day and really in the taper you, you need to take that load out because you need the body to be fresh and to recover and so their mind is telling them i need to train i need to train you know 
Uh, and so often it's about pulling them back. But the advice that I give is, and um, some of this I've got from Duncan French at mm. UFC, um, who's excellent. And they're short, sharp, so a, you know, alactic power, alactic efforts. So six seconds or less max efforts, and that might be on the pads or takedowns or just like you know jumps or something, um, or even maybe what bike sprints or air bike sprints, but maximal alactic efforts with recovery, long recovery, mm-hmm. short, sharp efforts to maximize speed and those kind of neural qualities. And you get a bunch of, you know, decent downstream kind of chemical benefits from that without any fatigue or, or associated stuff. So the message is no fatigue, right? Don't create any burning sensation. Don't be fatigued during that week because you're just adding the stuff you've got to recover from. Let your body recover from the training camp. Uh, particularly if you're dehydrating and cutting weight as well as extra stress on all the systems. I think um, moving your training to the time of day that you're going to fight is an overlooked one. So if you're used to lifting at 11 in the morning and like smashing pads and sparring at three in the afternoon, but you're fighting as uh, one of my guys was, you know, at half past 10 on the Saturday evening, I would move the training a bit later every day towards that time, starting seven days out, Mm -hmm. to reset your circadian rhythm so that you are not completely like sleepy (laughs) or whatever. Even though you're not going to be sleepy because you've got adrenaline going in your system, but you want your body to be familiar with performing at that time of day. Mm -hmm. And that might be doing your fight-based warm-up, so getting your pad man, your coach, and going through the warm-up that you'll do in the dressing room, I think that's really key to have these kind of routines, these stable, predictable routines that athletes are familiar and comfortable with. So, yeah, get your hands wrapped. Do you warm up? Uh, don't create any fatigue. So, yeah, a couple of short, sharp sessions, maybe um, seven days out, five days out, four days out. And then, you know, media, media workouts, some light shadow boxing. You don't need much else. And then there's obviously the weight cut to, to consider. Mm. Uh, and I think psychologically, lots of um, visualization, if you can make a highlight reel of yourself, absolutely do <laughs> that. And watch it. Um, I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for that and you know, some good evidence to support that too. So I love that. So, so for any of the listeners wanting to implement that, so four days out will kind of be like the last, you would potentially perform a hard, a lactic training session, six second effort to probably two to three minutes rest, maybe five oh oh, got a bit of a fire alarm no (laughs) hold on folks uh sorry about that so yeah it was a i think it was a test it's gone off and i can't see anyone running past the door so (laughs) let's just carry on yeah i hope we can see it it burn a bit on live on the podcast but (laughs) so so that Uh, four days out then would be kind of like last electric effort maybe five sets of six seconds with two to three minutes rest kind of thing uh, yeah, something like that I might do um, depending on the modality. So I have used, say, um, an assault bike. And, you know, you can do like a six-second effort. See how many watts. Let's say let's say you can make a 1,000 watts is your, your best that you can manage in six seconds. So then you've got to hit at least 90% of that. So you'd have to hit at least 900, right? So do a six-second effort, hit 900, 950. And then uh, recover for, I would say, at least a minute. But you can, as an athlete, like self-selected recovery, you know, breathing through their nose, heart rate's 120 or below, nice and calm, and then hit it again. And I would say, you know, no more than eight of those. Perfect. Uh, that would be enough. And it, it, again, it depends on the person. Some people hate training, so you got to make them do something. <laughs> Most of the people I work with, you've got to pull them back. So then I might allow them, you know, um, some uh, maybe a minute to two minutes of shadow boxing. Yeah, you know, but again, like the, the focus is on speed, is on hand speed, and sharpness, and kind of feeling good. Um, mm-hmm. And then a pad, yeah, a, a pad set, maybe on a different day, a pad session. So one minute rounds, but within that, short, sharp, hard combinations, kind of act with bad intentions, um, but plenty of, you know, plenty of recovery between those. So more recovery than the person's used to. Yeah. You know, and it should this should it should feel very comfortable and easy and like the person should feel they want to do more they've only just warmed up and they want to do more and that's when you cut it yeah and this has been done in different sports i can remember a presentation after the um 
well, the last two Olympic cycles in uh, hockey, field hockey, where we, we win medals, we're good at field hockey. And they introduced these priming sessions mm. and they would put them about eight hours before a game. And that would be a 20 minute uh, kind of sprint focused warm ups, like really aggressive 10, 15, 20 meter sprints. Um, and then like long recovery, you know, some short passes or a short corner or something like that. Get the guys primed um, and then, you know, relax. And that seemed to have a beneficial kind of physiological mm -hmm. effect later on. So yeah, short and sharp is the way to go. Uh, not creating any fatigue um, and lots and lots of positive visualization. Yeah. Oh, perfect. But that, that's a perfect way to, to end this podcast too. But where can people find you and follow you and, and keep in touch with your research and all the things you're posting? Uh, so I'm at the Fight Lab UK on Instagram and Instagram's probably the, the main platform that I post and share on so yeah the Fight Lab UK very happy for people to reach out with a message and always always nice to make content that people want so you know if you want to know more about something or a particular post like just drop me a message I'm on Twitter uh, or X uh, eBaker coach I don't tweet very much but uh, so Instagram and I have a website thefightlab.co.uk uh, where you can you know get my stuff programs and stuff like that perfect no thanks for coming on Ed I made sure to follow you and I'll link everything down in the description for people to, to easily find you as well but uh, thanks for coming on I appreciate it thank you appreciate it great